Ian Jury had his first number one record at the age of 37. It had been a long, hard struggle by this artist poet to be accepted, with his peculiar brand of English music hall set to jazz and rock. There was a lot of warmth and a lot of love, but there was a lot of fuck you as well. He's a cripple. He can't be a rock star. Yes, I fucking can. Ian Jury was a Gene Vincent fan who overcame his disabilities caused by childhood polio to become the nation's favourite pop jokester. An artist who decided he wanted to be a rock star, he ended up topping the charts around the world by setting his East London life to rock and roll. But it wasn't easy. His overnight success was the result of many years' adventures with his original band, Kilburn and the High Roads. I don't impress myself as a singer. Um, I'm not worried about it because I'm, I'm quite a good actor and I can get through by letting the feeling of the words that I write come out and it's me that wrote them so I can relate to it in that way. Born in the middle of the war, 1942, in Harrow, Ian and his mother evacuated to Ireland where her parents lived, leaving his bus driver father to fend for himself during wartime London. Our father, who art in Hendon, Harrow Road be thy name. Thy Kingston come, thy Wimbledon. In Eric was it is in Hendon. When Ian returned after the war, his parents' marriage was over and he was brought up by his mum and her sister in the London suburbs of Upminster. It was an idyllic childhood in the countryside east of London. Panic struck hard when the shadow of polio darkened the promise of Britain's holiday months. Summer month notifications of the dread disease reached three times the normal average. Thank you. Ian was one of the unlucky ones. It all went pear-shaped in the hot summer of 1949, when on a visit to South End he caught polio from contaminated water in the swimming pool. It was the disease that everyone at the time dreaded. At worst, it killed you, or left you immobile in an iron lung, or caused your body to be twisted out of shape and useless. I just got up one day and had like a flu, and I laid down on a couch, and the next thing I remember was being in an ambulance. And then I remember being in a, a kind of hazy, nightmare, fevery world for about six weeks. My mum told me, I look, I'll come and have a last look through the window, because I didn't think I was going to make it. And I turned the bedside light on by my bed, there's a little white face on the pillar. But I was still there in the morning, because I'm a goer. I remember being in plaster for ages, I mean six months. And then after that, I went to Chaley Heritage Craft School till I was about 12, so five years I was institutionalised. The Queen and the two princesses visited the Heritage Craft School. There are some 350 children at Chaley, where they're prepared for the day they will earn their own living and taught to fend for themselves in spite of their physical disabilities. I'm spasticus! Well, my left leg don't really work. My left arm don't work as well as it should. And I wear a caliper on my left leg. And uh, I suppose I'm fairly disabled. With an arm and gammy leg, at 12 he was sent to the Royal Grammar School in High Wycombe. I suppose my visual awareness and my idea of what kind of life, a style you could acquire, was always much more interesting to me than any kind of academic qualification. Um, I was very good at English at school. His heroes were rock and rollers, and already a bit of a Ted, he would bunk off school to watch Wee Willie Harris and others at the Two Eyes. Good at drawing as well as English, he studied art at Walthamstow and later at the Royal College of Art, where he met pop artist Peter Blake, who was to become his mentor and lifelong friend. And he just said to me, do you like rock and roll? 
Oh, yeah, I love it, yeah. He said, do you like, like boxing and wrestling? Yeah, true. Pin up. I went, yeah. He said, well, why don't you paint me pictures like that? I went, no. Good question. Although that wasn't linked up, the painting with the music, there was the same vibe coming from it, in a way. It's like a similar new excitement. I saw the swinging 60s from underneath Robert Fraser's table. Yeah. Yeah. And I went with Christine Kaufman, Tony Curtis. Yeah. And, and always Brian Jones. Always Brian Jones. And, always yeah. Brian Jones and, and you know, two or three. Charlie Watts was always John there. John was always yeah. Yeah. Rocky. William Burroughs. Yeah. He used to be there, didn't he? Ray the Raver. Yeah. Out cold on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That part of life appealed to me. The bohemian artist with long hair and extremely ornate clothing of a, a disreputable looking nature. He may have enjoyed the 60s as a drunken bohemian artist, but music remained an important part of his makeup, even when working as an illustrator or teaching painting to art students at Canterbury. He decided to form a rock and roll group. Russell Hardy, his piano playing flatmate, was asked to join. He just said, I'm going to uh, start this rock and roll band, you know, how'd you like to become a millionaire? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, that sounds pretty good to me, you know. Later, art student Humphrey Ocean took up the bass and followed as a disciple. He said, you know, would, would you like to be in it? You know, we just got to look good. <laughs> I wasn't on my guitar playing skills or anything, but I did know an A and a D and an E, that sort of thing. He's ahead of us all. When he courted music, he played drums, you know, and he'd be he'd sing something and he'd be sitting at a table, you know, the refectory table or whatever it was, you know, and he'd be just banging out, you know, and good. He could do something really, you know, trills, runs down the past the baked beans. You know. But what I did very sensibly, I went to the social secretary of the art school. I said, What are you doing at the Christmas? And he said, oh, I'm going to dance, get a few bands in. I said, well, put me in. And he went, well, of course, you give me a good assessment, I'll put you in the gig. All right? I said, yeah. And that was a reason to rehearse. Things like Johnny Be Good and 20 Tiny Fingers. I used to work in a factory when I was sort of 15. And, uh, and that's all they had on all day, was all that, the, 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 what you call the top of the pops now. But it was all that sort of stuff, Al McCogan. I mean, Ian came from this sort of similar era. I think we also did I Made Mary Cry in a Lonely Bus Shelter, which was one of it, it, you know, Ian's first penned lyrics. I made Mary cry in a lonely bus shelter. It wasn't, you know, a traditional love song. I put in my little thing me jig in the back of her leg Severed a hamstring In the lonely bus shelter I paid no attention whatsoever But I made Mary beg The rock and roll lifestyle was taking Ian away from the art school circuit and didn't sit well with his private life. Ian was living with his wife, artist Betty Rathmull, and had two kids, one a newborn baby. This caused problems when the band wanted to rehearse at their house. She had to come downstairs and tell us all to shut up because she wanted to get some sleep, you know, <laughs> after giving birth to Baxter. I'm like, oh, is that some And now when I think about it, I just cringe, you know. She put up with a lot with Ian. So, I mean, one particular instant there was a... I came downstairs, this great crashing noise, and there was sort of Bessie and Ian having a right ding-dong in the kitchen, you know, and there's, there's bloody plates flying everywhere. A life of broken China Sneering. And I think that was the point, you know, when I think they decided that Ian would take the band and live up in London and sort of more or less left her to her own devices out there. In London, the Kilburns graduated to the new pub rock scene, which was burgeoning across the city, and created a loyal cult following. An 
early fan was Eric Gordon, later to become known as Reckless Eric. And the country ride. They look like, if you like, inmates of a long-term institution. I, I could well believe that they'd arrived in a variety minibus, a variety club minibus, you know. They had really crappy haircuts somehow. They had this air of, of shabbiness and, and depravity. It was like a bad tightrope walker. It was like they were going to just fall to bits, just complete, but they didn't. They were like, they look, they were like a, a badly constructed shed that's fallen to pieces after 25 years of misuse. They were, they were so crummy, but they were so good. BP Fallon became part of the Kilburn's entourage and Ian's publicist and advisor. Ian was always very conscious of how he was being perceived and part of that was the clubber and of course part of that was the attitude. He's standing there at the microphone and I, I, I'm thinking, well, he's a, a bit a hard case. He was the first person, to my knowledge, to ever wore earrings made out of razor blades. I was sort of 19 or 20 or whatever I was, and like, I was a bit over the hill, really, but he was really, like, old, which was kind of made it more dangerous, really. Charlie Gillett was a BBC DJ with a top rock and roll radio show at the time and managed the Kilburns for a while. But the main thing was just the amazing range of material that they were doing. I mean, I, there were one or two songs which I absolutely hated in all my, my teenage years, one of which was Tallahassee Lassie, don't tell me why, and the other was Twenty Tiny Fingers, and this band had the temerity to do both of those, but on the other hand, they were doing their own material. Right, we're going to do some uh, reggae sort of stuff. More than you got the gorgeous bum. Why don't you? You're more than fair. You've got a gorgeous bum. Starts off and then goes on to the snapping of knicker elastic. A tender woman. Don't let nothing spoil it. I shall caress your clitoris as we reach the toilet. And I think anyone who can write a pop song with the word clitoris in it should be Poet Laureate. I got the mama rumba, woo, the he felt he had limitations in his voice. So the, for all, always the, the kind of creation of the music in Cuba and the High was, was this kind of struggle between him conquering his limitations, trying to hide them, being embarrassed about them, and being a vehicle for some amazing musicians. The, the piano player in the original Kilburn the High Road is called uh, Russell Hardy. It's just an amazing kind of uh, archive. Uh, he could play like a jazz musician, he could play like a pub piano player, and for him it was, there was no distinction. <laughs> never seemed to me to be an enormous number of people in the audience at any time. We find out afterwards that among the audience, there's people who were to later form Madness, members of the Sex Pistols. Ian was determined he didn't want it to be arty-farty, anything like that. It needed to be more vulgar. And, uh, but, it, but the musicians that he originally knew were jazz musicians. And so there were all these fights, because jazz musicians think they know about music. Well, I'm sorry, they do know about music. But as far as Ian was concerned, that wasn't necessarily what was relevant. Despite internal arguments and a changing lineup, the Kilburns attracted the interest of Pie Records. They issued a couple of singles, which were jukebox flops, and an album, Handsome. It was full of idiosyncratic storytelling songs that laid the foundation of Ian's future work, stories about characters and places that he knew. I wrote this thing called England's Glory, which was all the things that I thought were not necessarily nice, but were there about England. So it was like um, Frankie Howard, Noel Coward, and Sherlock Holmes, Frankie Vaughan, Kenneth Holm, and Garden Gnomes. I can't remember all of it, but Enid Blight and things, all kinds of little bits and pieces. Hold a jewels in the crown of England's glory. England's glory. Too numerous to mention but a few. But a few. And everyone could tell a different story. Different story. And show a Jack 
He understood the initial templates of rock and roll, Elvis, Jim Vincent, but equally he understood Tommy Cooper, equally he understood Max Wall. Well, all the jewels in the crown of England. After four years, it was the final curtain for the Kilburns. Things had been going downhill. Pianist Russell Hardy had been replaced by a new keyboardist, Chaz Jankel, who was to take Ian in a new direction as his co-writer. The truth of the matter was he was burnt out. I think, I don't know how long he'd had the Kilburns together. It might have been three or four years. Um, but this was the last, you know, formation of it. And he was dry, he, he'd had enough. He needed a breath of fresh air. And fortunately, you know, I, I was that, you know, the, the, in the right place at the right time. As the emerging punk groups took flight, Ian retired to Catship Mansions, where he lived with his girlfriend, Denise Rudette. Very methodical about things, actually. It, it didn't sort of um, fit, wake up full of inspiration and, oh, I'll write a song, do you know? It was actually put together um, methodically, and that's, um, that's how the lyrics always worked. And he would sit there in this room, at his desk and his cardboard cutout of Gene Vincent and always a groovy album cover at the front and he would sculpt his words the beauties but brief shall I warn your decline with some thunderbird wine and a black handkerchief I miss your sad one of the first songs to emerge was Sweet Jean Vincent. Sweet. It didn't sell. Sweet Jean Vincent, very much his concept. You know, he, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to do it slow at the beginning. And I seem to think he even came up with the S.O. Blue. Boo, 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 boo. You know, yeah, there's a, that little thing, that little lick. And off we go. I finished my job table clearing at Swan and Edgar's restaurant in Piccadilly, got the tube down, stopped in this pub, and saw the sex pistols on Bill Grundy. And after that, I went round to see Ian. He said, I'll come in, I'm just finishing off doing something with Chaz. And they were finishing off a song called Sweet Jean Vincent. But that's an incredible day, isn't it, really? He'd have, you know, the lyrics all sort of like neatly sort of, sort of um, presented on a table when I arrived. Coffee? Yeah, I love coffee, mate. And I'd go through them. See, I do little sketches, little couplets. The human leg is a source of delight. It carries your weight and governs your height, like that. And there's one over there that says, Christ, it's a geezer. And that's the only thing on a big bit of paper, like that. He'd sort of sex and drugs rock would be placed near the top, because every time I'd look at it, I'd go, yeah, we all know about that. I know, and I, I was a bit, I was a bit sort of dismissive about it, just because, well, we all knew about it, you know. But no, actually, funny enough, nobody actually had coined the phrase. Sex and drugs and How about this? He goes, down, 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 down. I thought, well, that's blunt, very musical. Sex and drugs. And a few months later, I was round at Ian's flat. And he puts on a record called Change of the Century. And after about one minute, in there's this bass solo. And I'm sort of looking at something going, I have sounds familiar. I went, oh my God. He hasn't, has he? 
and I look up and there's him standing in the doorway a grin from ear to ear this ear to the ear and uh, with two cups of coffee and I went you so and so <laughs> After a year of writing together, Ian and Chaz had a portfolio of great songs which needed demoing. To record them, Chaz enlisted an experienced rhythm section who'd been working for different bands. They became the Blockheads. Punk hit and, you know, we all went, uh, and there was Ian, so we went, great, you know, he wants a band, he wants some musicians, so there we were. And it, and it worked, a dream, you know, we met under some railway arches, I think, the first time I met you and Ian in South London. And I never met anybody like him at all in my life. When Chaz got his hands on the blockhead and started to streamline them into this great musical machine, which at the time was quite remarkable, that, that, that kind of ability in playing, because it just didn't really exist in England. Um, that's when those records started to come together. You know. Dave Robinson was an old mate from the pub rock days who'd started his own Maverick Stiff record label and was even in his small hits with a roster of punk-inspired artists and Elvis Costello. It was to be the natural home for Ian Joy and the Blockheads. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to have been us. We would have been worried all the time about great big contracts and front money and oh, all the rest of it, which I've had a little bit of before with other record companies. And all it does is scramble your eggs for you straight away. As we all know, he was a great kind of showman. And he had a whole load of, you know, ideas and props and things he wanted to do. Very opinionated. He was quite difficult to get along with, honestly. Even his new blockheads immediately went on a tour showcasing the stiff talent. At the same time, his album of the new songs, New Boots and Panties, was released to rapturous reviews. Great days. Um, we did this to Dave Edmonds, Nick Lowe, Elvis Costello, you know, Reckless Eric. The line of it is you know, in doing the blockheads. Can we do it there, under that cloud, Danny? She's the one with the man feet, you can bring. It's not on. Tour, it became obvious that the songs from the album had hit a nerve and became instant favourites. transformation was complete, it was total. Ian relaxed. You know, at last, the blockheads gave him an arena that he could be himself in. He had this kind of menacing kind of white suit and a walking cane and everything. And I think most of the students that we played to had never seen anything like him before because they weren't all hip to Kilburn and the high roads like me. The Blockheads, you know, just gave him muscle. He felt mighty, he felt like, you know, Al Capone, you know, with all his gang members behind him. What a Waste, a song from the Kilburns days, was released as a single and became Ian's first chart success. What a way. Well, 
Now getting the success he wanted and deserved, the constant touring was wearing in more ways than one. Ian was king of stiff in more ways than one. What was very interesting was in the way that the girls were mad for him. There was one particular girl who was just dribbling for him. She would be at every gig. She was terrified of him. That was the attraction. You know, a Peter Cushing of Robin Hood. Humphrey Ocean, where are you? Come and dance with us. We all got famous, really, and people started hitting each other and falling out, and life got very drunk and unpleasant and um, nasty for a while. He could get uh, tired and emotional, you know, Ian could. A few drinks late at night and smoke a bit of you know, the jazz woodbines, and uh, he would, um, he could get difficult. Okay, you do it. Sex and drugs and rock and rock. The pressure was so much in those early days. He'd actually was hooked on sleeping tablets. You know, you had such a problem coming down after a gig. They used to take these things to get, you know, to get some kit. Uh, but then he found himself hooked on it. Well, life fell apart, really, you know. It seemed that everyone split up with their girlfriend. I did. Ian and Denise split up. Their personal lives just were a mess. Their personal lives may have been a mess, but his success continued. New Boots and Panties was in the charts for 73 weeks and reviewed in the broadsheets as much for the lyrics and poetry as for the music, giving Ian a platinum record and virtually keeping his record company in business. We never stopped working for probably about 14 months. We were yeah. always out there and blasting away at it. We had two articulated lorries full of, <laughs> full of equipment, two coaches full of people. Take it easy down the front, lean back a little bit, because you're killing about 15 gentlemen who don't deserve it. So, can you ease off a little bit? Otherwise I shall come down here and straighten you all out, like. Tours followed tours, but success was a double-edged sword. It's a plastic throne, you know, because there becomes no reality anymore. No one says what they think anymore. No one will say, that vocal you did was shite. That's all very good, everything's good, you know, suddenly the guy's shit and gold. Well, that's not so. He's still a human being. In the wilds of Borneo And the vineyards of Bordeaux Though things went sour for a while, Ian was nothing if not a survivor and went on to even greater success with his next record. Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick went to number one all over the world. His heyday was to last for three exhilarating years. The Upminster Kid had become part of England's glory. Hit me, hit me, hit me, hit me with your